Have you ever thought about what makes a great public space? You probably can think of a few great places. Boston Commons, maybe Bryant Park in New York, Millennium Park in Chicago, maybe a place in your own community. We all know a great place when we see one. And with all the new attention to urban living, to downtown revitalization, with moving downtown, why don't we have more and better public spaces? After all, the era of building and designing for cars and suburban living is over. But it's left us with a heavy legacy of, cars that are pa of streets that are parked with cars, of empty parks, and of concrete plazas, and even award-winning designs like uh, Pershing Square in Los Angeles, you see on the slide here, designed in 1993, don't really work for people. It was designed to be a symbol. It was designed to make a statement. It wasn't really designed for people. You would say, well, that was in 93. We don't do this anymore. But we do. So this is 2016, brand new park, designed to become a stage for an adjacent building, designed to be looked at from a drone or a high-rise office window. Not so good for people. Public spaces are also places where social issues become visible. Social isolation, social exclusion, homelessness, gentrification, all these things can become very obvious in a public space if we know where to look. The study of how people use public spaces has deep roots. It's not a new science. And one of the pioneers of this science was William White. He was an urbanist, he was a writer, and he was really a pioneer of direct observation. He used film and camera to record and really understand what people did in New York City public plazas and parks. And he started doing this work in the 60s and the 70s. So he used 33 millimeter film. He used old school cameras, all to understand how people use space and what do they need to enjoy their public spaces. And he noted that great public spaces are actually made out of a set of basics. It's not very complicated, and the first most important thing, of course, is other people. And not just any people, but a diversity of people, as we mentioned earlier. So one of the quickest ways to assess the health of a public space is to look around and see how many women are in the space. When a space has more women than men, it means that it's safe and it's comfortable. So next time you go in a public space, do that test. We also want places with food. Food is always great. And yes, sometimes you have sad scenes like this one where the only person not eating ice cream is the little kid. But we do love food in public space. And you know there is an explosion of street food. There is ice cream. There is food carts, food trucks, food markets. We've discovered street food. And that is because we want the accessibility. We want the diversity. We want to connect to each other and have some fun. Another basic component, water. A lot of traditional public spaces used to have these very serious fountains, untouchable. But lately, we've seen a proliferation of sprinkle pads, of splash fountains, water that is meant to be touched and enjoyed. And that's the right direction to go. And of course, we need places to sit. Places to sit in the shade or in the sun next to a stranger or maybe further away and sometimes even the opportunity to bring our own chair. Our needs as human beings are not that complicated. So, what makes a place comfortable? When we're really comfortable, we kick back, we relax, 
we take our shoes off. So seeing people barefoot in a public space is a sure sign that people feel comfortable, they feel they belong, and they feel that they really can take over this public space. Triangulation. It's all about layering activities. So giving us simple things to do is not enough. It makes for a thin experience. So our goal is always to connect smaller activities together to create the whole that's bigger than the sum of its parts. So people can connect to each other, strangers can talk to each other, find a common ground. At the end, it's all about coming together, sharing, and making new connections. So placemaking, what does placemaking have to do with great public spaces? Placemaking is the process of creating those public spaces. It's a collaborative process. It's about people coming together to create places in their own communities. And it is a practice that at Projects for Public Spaces, the nonprofit planning and design organization where I've been working for almost 20 years, we've been developing since the 90s. We started using the term placemaking sometime in the mid-90s, but today you may have heard this word from other practitioners. So it's really becoming uh, not just a fad, but a practice that many people in the urban field are using, and it's really about people working together. So one of our most important principles is that the community is the expert. And what do we mean by that? We don't mean that we're expecting untrained people from the communi community to come out and start designing public spaces. But we really mean to have a conversation and to engage the community from the onset of the process, to give people the place to brainstorm ideas and to really be the drivers of coming up with the places that they need because they already know what they need and what they, their desires are. So our role as urban professionals is really a role of facilitation, of providing and supporting information, and really coordinating and leading the process along. So more, more than anything else, placemaking is a process. And it takes many forms. There is workshops, there is site evaluation, there is happy hour. There is little pop-ins where you can talk to people very quickly. There is even festivals and events that we organize in communities so people can come together and we can talk to them and understand what their needs are and what they really need in their community. A space can become a place. A space and a place are not the same things. So in downtown Houston, we worked in a parking lot and a derelict park to create one of the most successful downtown parks in Houston. It's called Discovery Green. It even has a boat pond. And we started with a parking lot. In downtown Detroit, we were able to re revitalize and bring the old downtown heart back through this collective process, working through a site that had nothing but traffic and had become a a traffic intersection to create a park that today attracts millions of people every year. In nearby Harvard, this is Harvard Plaza, and it's actually a space that sit, sits atop of the Cambridge Street underpass. It's essentially a cap and has become a plaza that connect, har, connects Harvard Yard with the Science Center. Of course, it has food. It is hungry students. And it has a, a fabulous winter program. So if you're there this winter, there is fire pits, there is marshmallows, there is ice skating, there is curling. So go there and see it. You can't do it alone. Placemaking is all about partnerships and a lot about unlikely partners. So it could be senior volunteers staffing a game cart, like in this park, Woodruff Park in downtown Atlanta. It could be homeless youth working with artists to provide programming on Hennepin Avenue in Minneapolis. It's also about lighter, quicker, cheaper. So lighter, quicker, cheaper is about impactful, 
big changes that can be done quickly without big funds and long, long construction projects, which doesn't mean that we don't want to do long-term change in construction, but it means that when you engage people, you can't ask them to wait five years until we're done with construction. Their needs are going to change. Their kids are going to be out of, college, uh, out of high school and into college. They're going to need to do something else. So with Lighter, Quicker, Cheaper, back in campus marshes in Detroit I was showing you earlier, we were able to transform one of the underused lawns into an urban beach in just three months. It's basically a sandbox. It has a lot of seating, a place for kids and families, a place for downtown workers because it's downtown. And of course, there's a lot of office workers and a little down, uh, beach cafe. You can see the little white pop-up tent, which evolved through the years into a portable co container that serves food and drinks. And at the end of summer in October, all of this gets packed away to make room for ice skating. So lighter, quicker, cheaper gives you a lot of flexibility and a big bang for your buck. We also want to program, program for diversity. And in some places, like in Bryant Park, diversity may mean activities for kids and families, a carousel and a children's reading room, in downtown Philadelphia, it meant engaging the LGBTQ community through performances by the Philadelphia Gay Men's Choir. In Foro Limburg, in Park in Mexico, in Mexico City, it meant adding family programming and activities for kids to their mobile library. Places can build resiliency, and this is really the big lesson of Foro Limburg that I just showed you. This is the community in Mexico City that spontaneously gathered at Foro Limburg right after the earthquakes last year. People brought supplies. People felt that they will be safe there. They were volunteers. They gave each other mutual aid, all coming together in this place because they were already connected to it. So at the end of the day, place and creating a place requires a lot of disciplines and a lot of knowledge. But place also touches on so many things, from architecture and design, which are the obvious things, to community development, transportation, community resiliency, lifelong learning, the built environment, sustainability. Place is also where you can start to address a lot of social problems, from inclusion and equity to helping your community connect better, build social capital, create local economies that are supportive and sharing. At Project for Public Spaces, we started building an international movement around placemaking about six or seven years ago. And today, this is the map of all the people around the world that are part of our movement. They're self-identified. They say they're doing placemaking. I'm sure everybody is doing it in a different way, but you can see they're everywhere. People want to contribute. So I want to leave you with, with this. You can transform your own community through placemaking. You don't need to be an urban professional to do it. You can be an activist. You can be a participant. You can look at your places in a different way and contribute and making it, make it happen. So good luck and go enjoy your public spaces. Thank you.